Okay, great. I imagine folks will continue to trickle in, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Excited that you're here with us tonight. My name's Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Um, this evening, we're discussing a new uh, oral history um, collection from Voice of Witness and Haymarket Books, this book here, Beginning Again, Stories of Movement and Migration in Appalachia, which brings together uh, 12 narratives um, of refugees, migrants, and generations long residents that explore complex journeys of resettlement. Uh, Firestorm is a 16 year old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, our collective strives to feature uh, books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to book events virtually, uh, both because we really like to reach um, authors and contributors at a distance, um, but also because we know that a lot of folks in our community continue to have significant barriers to participating in in-person events. So uh, our next virtual event is going to be on November 23rd, and that will continue the Rattling the Cages series with former political prisoners. Uh, and that particular session will focus on the experiences of incarcerated women. So definitely encourage you to check that out. If you're interested in learning more about our upcoming events, you can look at our online calendar or follow us on social media. And I'll share a link in the chat in just a moment. And speaking of the chat, um, we are using uh, Zoom tonight, um, which includes a couple different tools. There is an open chat that you are welcome to use, um, as well as a QA. and a uh, and I would encourage you to put any questions for our panelists tonight in the Q&A. Um, it's less likely to get lost or buried than in the chat. Um, and definitely write those questions out as we go, uh, rather than wait until the very end when there's time set aside uh, for audience Q&A. It's always nice to have a few questions um, once we get there. Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, I want to thanks so much um, Katrina and Fanny for joining us and I'll kind of briefly provide some bios. Uh, Katrina Powell is a professor of rhetoric and founding director of the Center for Refugee, Migrant and Displacement Studies at Virginia Tech. Her research focuses on displacement narratives and with the Virginia Tech uh, Appalachian, I swear I can pronounce my own region, uh, mm -hmm. Appalachian Studies Program. Uh, Katrina is co-directing the Monuments Across Appalachian Virginia project funded by the Mellon Foundation. Thanks so much, Katrina. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Fanny Garcia is the educational program manager at Voice of Witness and facilitates the books, uh, the organization's book series. Uh, as an oral historian, Fanny uh, seeks to amplify diverse voices and shed light on silent stories. She's particularly interested in how personal narratives can bridge cultural divides, challenge preconceived notions, and contribute to a more comprehensive and equitable historical record. And we're so happy to have you here tonight, Fanny. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. I know you all have lots to share. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And I'm excited to introduce uh, Voice of Witness and the Beginning Again book and project and to be in conversation with Katie today. Um, and thank you to Firestorm Works for hosting us and to everyone joining us virtually. We know there may be other things in life right now. There's lots happening in the world, um, pulling at our attentions, but we're so happy that you were able to join us tonight. And um, to give you a little bit of uh, info on Voice of Witness, we're an oral history nonprofit that advances human rights by amplifying the voices of people impacted by and fighting against injustice. And we have many programs uh, that are part of our organization, uh, including educational curriculum, workshops, um, we have an active YouTube channel with a lot of recordings of past events and book series events, which is why we're here today to tell you about uh, a book that was part of the VOW book series, um, Beginning Again, Stories of Movements and Migration in Appalachia, 
Voice of Witness um, provided the oral history training. Some of the oral history training for this uh, book uh, provided editorial guidance and funding for the project, um, and which led to the publication of it through Haymarket Books. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the increased anxiety many of us are experiencing after the recent elections in this country and how the aftermath of those elections might impact our immigrant communities and also those experiencing the impact of climate disaster and natural disasters in the region and across the country. And um, on a personal note, and an, as an immigrant from Honduras, I've been deeply moved by the stories of solidarity in Beginning Again, and I cherish it as a guide about how we care for each other and ourselves as we move forward um, after this election cycle. Um, so Katie, let's get started. I'm excited to talk to you. Tell us why oral history for this project? Why now? Why work with Val? Well, thanks so much, um, Liberty and Firestorm Books um, and Fanny for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, this project began really after um, a similar feeling of an election uh, in 2016 and 17. Um, I was working with some graduate students and we were planning an event on our campus at Virginia Tech, um, which is here in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is um, on the Monacan and Tutelo lands. And we were planning an event to welcome newly arrived refugees from Syria. Um, and Afghanistan. And in planning that event, um, sort of in the midst of the aftermath of the election, um, we were concerned about uh, families feeling welcome and we wanted them to know that um, our campus and, and our groups would be ones that would welcome them. We wanted them to understand the university as a place of resource for them and their children as they began going to um, elementary and high school in our area, but then also maybe hopefully become students at Virginia Tech. And so in the, in doing that and meeting people um, and hearing a lot of the kinds of stereotypes that were floating around, not only about refugees and immigrants in the area and what that might mean for the area um, with people moving in, but also negative stereotypes about Appalachia. So I grew up in Appalachia and have you know, witnessed and been party to lots of uh, uh, negative stereotypes about what it means to be Appalachian. And so suddenly th those negative stereotypes about both kinds of groups were floating around at one time. And so we got this idea to put the narratives together in one place. So um, we have people who, in Appala there's a sense that Appalachia is a place of stasis, that um, only one kind of person lives here or that it's never changed, it's always been the same, and it's always been a place of movement and migration. And so by putting narratives together um, uh, by people who have a lot of diverse experience. So whether one's family has lived here for generations, um, like Rufus, who's from the Monacan Indian Nation, or whether someone um, has recently moved because they've uh, been forced to flee their home, such as uh, Amal from the Syrian war, um, they were all trying to make home here in Appalachia. And we wanted to put those narratives together to find out, you know, what does it, what, and talk about what it means to be Appalachian, what it means to um, make a home in a landscape like Appalachia. Um, and oral history was um, made sense to me. I had done an oral history project before. Um, I did a project about Shenandoah National Park and families that had been displaced when Shenandoah was formed um, in the 1930s. And I interviewed descendants of families who had been displaced. And that was really fascinating because um, I grew up around, I grew up hiking in, in Shenandoah. I have always known that story of families being displaced. And as I grew up and moved away from the area for a while, 
it surprised me that people didn't know that history in our country. Um, and, you know, indeed, the United States is founded on displacement, um, eminent domain is a, um, a part of our uh, Constitution. And um, so forcible displacement and migration and movement are a part of our history since the very beginning. And so it surprised me when I learned that people didn't understand that families have been displaced in order to form some of the national parks and in particular Shenandoah. So um, in order to um, learn more about that history and to make sure that some of those untold stories were more available publicly, um, I conducted an oral history project uh, for that. And um, so it made sense to me to turn to oral history. Um, and one of the reasons I was interested in Voice of Witness for that is because of Vo Voice of Witness's um, emphasis on um, the birth to the present. So it, um, there's an emphasis on trauma informed interviewing. And so not, not reducing someone to their trauma experience um, is a key uh, part of the methodology at Voice of Witness. And I think that's really important in terms of understanding a broader history, not only a broader history about a region, but a broader history about a person, that their displacement experience is not their only part, is not the only part of their identity. So. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, um, what do you think it is about oral history that provides a space for engagement and understanding um because i i was really taken by your response about how oral history provides a full view an embodied a three-dimensional view of who a person is so what is it because there are other forms of interviewing right so why do you think oral history specifically provides such deep engagement well I, I was trained as a journalist, I'm trained as a writer, I've trained as an ethnographer, so I've done lots of different kinds of interviews before and oral history in part makes the most sense for me as a listener. It, it The long form aspect of it is something I think that is really important to give people a chance to um, answer questions but then also to come back around to something you know after you've been talking to someone for an hour or two you might remember an, a detail um, it also gives the interviewer a chance to follow up um, and focus on multiple aspects of someone's experience or identity not just the one event a, a journalist is usually pretty tied to a particular event or um, issue. And so this book too has an issue about migration and movement, but um, people were able to tell their stories in relation to their entire life story um, and how a place like Appalachia was a place of, of home and homemaking, um, but while at the same time um, very realistic about some of the challenges that uh, people face in the in the region as well. Um, so I, I just feel like oral history, um, even by its very title, um, emphasizes the storytelling nature of telling someone's um, experience. Um, and Appalachia is full of great storytellers, um, and as are many other regions in the world. And so um, oral history is, is a way for those storytellers to come together in one place. Yeah, I did. I did feel that there's a certain rhythm in the narratives that are in beginning again. Um, tell me, you know, you started this project as you could say in the aftermath of the 2016 election, which um, began, uh, which in 2017 Trump was um, uh, became president, and now. You're launching, you've launched the book on the eve of another Trump administration. How does that book, how do those bookends, um, I don't know, I guess, provide the answer for why beginning again is so important? Well, in some ways it's shocking, in some ways it isn't. I, I think I'm probably feeling similarly to some folks here tonight. Um, um, 
and it, the, the project took a long time. I, I think most of Voice of Witness projects don't take quite this long. I, I, we, and the, the pandemic had something to do with that in terms of being able to follow up with people in person and do interviews. So we shifted a bit to some uh, online interviews. Um, but it also just shows how politics ebb and flow, how life ebb and ebbs and flows. Um, and um, how how important telling stories is because I feel like the stories in this book really um, counterbalance some of the um, rhetoric that's flying around now about um, particular groups of people. And um, I, if we live next to people and we know people's experiences or we have them ourselves, we know what's in the popular news media is not true and how damaging it can be, not, not just in terms of um, other people not understanding the truth of someone's experience, but also because materially, then that can be policies get changed. Um, administrations change policies. Um, and so by having long form stories like this, where you can see over the course of someone's life, how um, politics and policy impacts someone directly, um, whether that's here in Appalachia or in some other part of the world, um, I think a book like this can provide some countervalence to what we're hearing in the popular news media. And I also feel like um, because we get the news cycles are full of short sound bites um, and often people, especially refugees and immigrants are reduced to victimhood. And these stories give folks a chance to um, help us see how they've come through some challenging times and how they're making a home. And I think in a moment like this, um, on the eve of, of the Trump administration taking over again, um, having some inspiration um, that we, we can come through it, um, I, I, I turn to these narratives as well for that. Yeah, I remember growing up, I arrived in the US as a 10 year old from Honduras and quickly after learning English, books were a place for me to find answers to this new world I had landed in. Um, so I'm glad that Beginning Again is gonna be made available to any new immigrants arriving. Um, we're gonna transition a little bit now, Katie, and I'm gonna ask you to read us an excerpt from one of the narrators um, and Please give us some context about the excerpt you're going to read and Amal's story so that our um, guests tonight can, can understand where you're reading from. Yeah, so one of the narrators is Amal, um, and Amal is her pseudonym. Um, she asked that we use a pseudonym uh, because her family remains in Syria and she's worried for their safety. Um, also, I think Amal and her family in reading the, you know, the interview we first did in 2017. And, and that's when I first met her at the workshop I was telling you about. Um, they had just recently arrived from Syria, Amal, her husband and their five children. And then when they were reading the final manuscript to be published, they were reading it, I guess, the early part of 2023, they all, really thought that that they put were they had put that time in their life behind them um so th those two things together um uh, made for for wanting to use a, a pseudonym but she's really uh, the family is wonderful wonderful family she was really excited to be part of the um process because she felt like she wanted uh, her family's story to be told for people to understand what was happening in syria and um the we we interviewed her three times and the first time we had a translator in arabic um the second time the translator was there and some of the conversation was in Arabic, but a lot of it was in English. And then the third time Amal said she did not want a translator. She she could speak to me in English and she's fluent in English. She learned English really quickly. And just her enthusiasm about that was just um, infectious, really. Um, she's a wonderful person. Um, so I'm just going to read a, a, one, of the, one of the things that was a little different about Amal's story um, 
Roanoke, Virginia is a, a resettlement city. So, uh, um, and there's an organization, Commonwealth Catholic Charities works there as the resettlement agency. Um, but it's a very, it's a small city, but it is an urban space. And some families would prefer to be in a more rural place. And so some families have moved to near uh, Virginia Tech and in Blacksburg um, as a way to be um, out of a more urban environment. But Amal and her family faced a little bit different situation, which you'll hear about in this excerpt. So this is from Amal's story. Thank you. The caseworkers wouldn't believe us until one day when we were sleeping. I heard a noise in the bedroom and the two girls were with me. I didn't even remove the plastic wrap from the mattresses because I was hoping to go to a clean house. So I just left them wrapped like that. The mice were just chewing through the plastic. We woke up, turned on the lights and the mice were with us in the room. My husband blocked the door and he was running after them and I was running after him taking videos of how he was trying to get them because they wouldn't believe us. They took, we took two videos of how they were eating our stuff, rice and flour and bulgur, all that stuff. The mice would get into it and we'd have to just dump everything. It was just disgusting. Two sofas, we found more mice. When we said we want something to be able to sit on, they said there was nothing for us. We would always go to the office. The baby was about two months old. We would begged them because of the horrible living conditions and the food that we tried to cook. We always had to dump because of the infestation. Then they said, you have to sign the lease. We would talk and talk and then they'd say, but it's important that you sign the lease. Once you sign, we're going to come and fix everything. Anything that's broken or torn, we'll fix it. We'll take care of everything. After we signed, we didn't see anybody come and take care of the problems. We'd go to their office and ask for the caseworker who was responsible for us. And we knew that he was there. We could see him and they'd tell us that he wasn't there. That time was really difficult for me. When you go about your day to day life, you just forget about what happens. But then we had to deal with the mice and the eviction. Those things reminded me of how difficult the whole situation was. Despite all the misery in Syria and all the sadness in Lebanon. And when we first came here, it re it was really not important as long as we were all together. We were going to get through this. We knew another family that had lost a husband and some kids. I saw a lot of difficult things. Our solace in this world is that we're together. I love that last line, our solace in this world is that we're together. But I think in this excerpt, Amal is really talking about the right to dignity, right? Could Katie, can you tell us about that? Yes, um, I think often, um, people who are in need of some sort of service or assistance, and that can be anyone, not just immigrants and refugees, but anyone, um, often get uh, responded to when they ask for something that they need, um, or they point out some sort of injustice or a right that's been um, um, infringed on, they're often told, well, you should be grateful that you have this service or you've had this assistance. And so the, the subtext of that, you, it, it means that you shouldn't complain. And Amal um, spent a lot of time telling us how she had to fight for the, the um, situation in her home um, to be one um, that was clean and for her children. She, she had little little kids um, and she, the, the, another really important part of this story in terms of policy is that when you have a large family like that, um, um, the rental, the laws about renting means you can, you have to have a certain number of bedrooms for a certain number of people in the family. And she said, we'll take a smaller house. We'll, we'll take us, but as long as it's clean, we'll, we can, it can, we can just live in two rooms. It's no problem, but Virginia law won't, wouldn't allow for that. And so it, it just points out some, you know, problems with policies and the and the way that uh, those things work out for people and she refused to live in that house. Um, and so in the end, they ended up moving um, to Blacksburg, which is how we met. Um, but yeah, I think that it, it, her story um, 
one speaks to her um, ability to be able to stand up for her rights, but then two, how often people are told um, that they should not request things or that they should be grateful simply because they have been given some sort of assistance. Yeah, like how how dare you ask for roses when we've given you bread, you know, <laughs> which is like bread and roses is like a, a, a slogan for activism and respect for dignity and human life. And um, also, I'm struck by how her story could be used to educate on how to improve the resettlement process for other refugees. Um, can you tell me if Amal talked about or, or if Amal shared why she wanted to tell this story in particular? Yeah, I think one reason she wanted to share the story was because when they were first living in those conditions, she and her husband wondered and really they regretted coming to the United States. I think there's this sense of, oh, if, if you... Um, go through the whole vetting process of, be, of becoming a refugee and you get resettled to the United States that, that suddenly the day you step off the plane and onto American soil that your life will be better and that that is largely a myth um, that there's a long process um, afterward of more and more paperwork more, you know all the the immigration process the citizenship process finding adequate housing finding adequate schooling the uh, if if uh, if there's a language barrier there and so i think she was really adamant and so there was a moment when she and her husband were wondering if they had made the right choice the the situation they lived in in lebanon they they fled syria to lebanon and the situation there was horrible. You're not allowed to become a citizen in Lebanon. They were living in someone's garage. Um, they had a difficult time getting medical care for one of their children. And so they decided to go through the refugee uh, vetting process. But she said after living in the United States for in, under these, um, these housing conditions, maybe we should have never left Lebanon, at least we knew the language there. Mm -hmm. And she said it was a very low moment for them, lower than what they had experienced in Lebanon. And um, so she was keen on making sure that that, that part of the story was known. A lot of people were interested in knowing, and, and she recounts in her narrative about the family fleeing bombings in the in Syria. And it's very dramatic um, and um, just gut wrenching. But she retold the story about the mice in the home in 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 their first house, because she felt like not everybody hears that part of the story. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate her commitment to telling that story. How do you, can you talk about how um, the current climate disasters have impacted refugee committee communities um, in Appalachia, how they're reacting to uh, the aftermath? Yeah, you know, um, it, you know, something like a uh, natural disaster impacts people differently and it's, maybe the flood or the hurricane is not itself <laughs> discriminant, but the services available um, or exacerbating people's particular situations um, is worse depending on um, what resources people already have or don't have. Um, having people show up who look like they might be from the government to your home with resources can be really triggering for people. Um, and, and this is true of people who've lived in Appalachia for generations, as well as people who've moved recently. Um, we had a situation here where at Virginia Tech, uh, we have a Corps of Cadets here, and they all wanted to volunteer to um, after Hurricane Helene to a neighboring county. Um, and the logistics of ma organizing that and getting uh, them to go to help um, was in part um, a concern for some of the residents be because they would not necessarily trust who showed up at their door with 
bu buckets and mops and say, here, I'm here to clean, you know, mop out the silt out of your home. And so having uh, a network of people who knew families um, already to be able to come and make introductions and say, here's some people, you know, you can trust these people to come in and help. Um, and that, so it has meant communities coming together. Um, and I'm sure that's true of, of the folks um, in uh, North Carolina as well. Um, and so some of the big machinery coming through um, to move a debris, so big um, uh, excavators or the tanks that, you know, whatever machinery is being used that, um, or helicopters flying, news helicopters flying over or search helicopters flying over, all those things can be triggering to someone who has experienced wartime. Um, again, what, whether someone's a refugee or a war veteran or, you know, there, there's lots of people in the community, no matter what their migration experience is, um, who could be impacted by that. And so um, that kind of um, sensitivity to what people might be going through and experiencing, even though someone is arriving to help, um, still being aware of um, the diversity of people's of people's experiences during that moment, it can be really important. Yeah, definitely. And um, you highlight in the book many organizations that are serving both long-term residents of the region and also recent um, arrivals. And how, can you tell us about what some of those organizations are and how they've all responded to respond to uh, the aftermath of the hurricane um, in the region, and also because when something like that happens, it's not refugees aren't responding just to refugees. You're responding to the whole crisis. So how has that evolved after um, mm -hmm. the current climate uh, disaster in the region? Well, one one organization in particular here, which is very local, I, I'm sure, unless someone's from right here, they might not even have heard of it, is Holler to Holler, and it was founded. It's a mutual aid organization founded here, actually, when um, the uh, severe flooding happened in eastern Kentucky, and a group of Virginia Tech faculty and students went and helped, um, again, sort of muck out people's houses that had been flooded. And then it sort of went dormant for a while until more recently with Hurricane Helene. And it just was already set up and the networks were already there, you know, phone number sharing. And it really became important for going way up in the hills to, um, uh, reach out to people to let them know that help was coming and who was coming and what what kinds of vehicles they would be in um, and um, so those kind of networks that are already set up so when you have big organizations like the Red Cross come or FEMA um, they're really and those organizations do this work too they know they know they have to connect with the local rescue squads or you know whatever local organizations there are but it's really key um, I think for uh, tight-knit communities um, maybe people who um, uh, live way back up in the mountains um, to be able to um, um, have those kinds of connections um, um, as as people are bringing resources. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really great transition to talk about Micaiah because there's an excellent line that I'm going to highlight after you read his excerpt, but okay. please introduce us to Micaiah and um, why you wanted to interview him for beginning again. Yeah, so uh, Micaiah is um, a young um, uh, African American man who um, graduated from Big Stone Gap High School um, in Big Stone Gap, Virginia, and um, he is part of the STAY project and was one of the leaders of um, Black Appalachian Youth Rising, and um, he was, uh, and his his family has lived in Big Stow Gap for generations. Um, he played football for the high school, um, and um, 
he, part of his um, story and what he was interested in telling me about is how often there's an assumption that just because he's black, he wouldn't want to stay in Appalachia, again, in part because of the negative stereotypes about what Appalachia is or who lives in Appalachia. And he really tries to counter that stereotype as a young black man. He would like to stay. He wants to live here. Um, and but like many youth, um, it's really difficult to stay because of uh, not very many um, economic opportunities. And so the STAY project is part of um, uh, trying to ma make economic um, uh, opportunities. Um, so I'll just read a little bit from his excerpt. You know, Big Stone Gap is not perfect, and when I was younger, I remember talking to my friends, and they'd all say, we can't wait to leave, but I'd say, I love it here. I love the mountains. I love being able to go outside to just sniff the air and have an almost overwhelming sense of nostalgia for how this place has shaped me to be who I am. Big Stone Gap is not perfect and it has its issues, but if we all leave, it's never going to get better. It's never going to be the community that we want to see. One day I plan on starting a family and I want to at least have the option to build my family here, to raise my family here, and then they raise their kids here if they want to. But we won't have that option if we don't have safe, inclusive communities. If we don't have the infrastructure to try to clean up the years of damage from extractive industries that left no clean drinking water, for example, there's so many issues that we need to fix, but it ain't going to happen if all the young people leave. If we all just decided that Appalachia is irredeemable and can't be safe, then who's going to fix it while we're all away? My favorite line is when he says, big stone gap is not perfect and it has its issues. But if we leave, if we all leave, it's never going to get better. It's never going to be the community that we want to see. And it just really highlights um, his commitment to making the home where he wants to live and grow a family better for other people. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what those extractive industries are that Micaiah mentions, um, mm -hmm. how they've impacted that community and, and probably reduced economic opportunities in the region. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the biggest thing is strip mining and the way that that has depleted not only particular kinds of resources from the land, but also left it um, bare so that when something like a hurricane comes through or just or even just heavy rains come through, then the, the landslides um, and flooding that happen as a result are, are exacerbated because of the fact that the trees and the foliage are not there to, rooted down to kind of keep the land in place place. Um, and so it makes it really difficult, you know, especially because it's it's routinized. It happens over and over again. So it's not just one big flood in, in one generation. It's multiple floodings um, and and um, and multiple times that people are cleaning up and having to fix things or repair things or replace things. Um, and so there's there's that um, you know very drastic change to the landscape, but then there's also you know uh, once the land is depleted, then corporations leaving and and um, and there not being particular employment there anymore. Um, so those are all kinds of things that some folks in Appalachia are are facing. Um, but the stay project is really interesting in terms of trying to figure out ways to make inclusive community make work out of making inclusive communities and it, um so i really encourage folks to um learn more about the stay project if they can um Micaiah also talks about um in one section of the excerpt that is not in this excerpt but he you ask um Probably, I imagine that you ask him because we don't see your questions. But he says something like, um, look around, who wouldn't want to live here? <laughs> um, yeah. Tell me about his love for the mountains. He mentions the mountains and the surrounding mm -hmm. nature. Yeah, he told he spent a lot of time telling me about playing football and he loved playing football, but he also worried about being stereotyped as 
the typical young black man who played football and then tried to make a life uh, playing football. He wanted to do different things, um, but he did love playing it in high school. And he talked about the football field being kind of down in a bowl and that in the fall, you know, on a Friday night, the smell of the fall leaves and the, or a moon shining brightly. He spent a lot of time just describing the landscape to me. Um, and then in that moment you're talking about where he said, who wouldn't want to live here? He, we, we had, inter we had done a few interviews, um, but this was the third one, I think, where we were on zoom and so i'm looking at him on screen and he gestures toward the window in his house and says look at where i live and the mountain is right out there and his his parents grandparents great grandparents had all grown up there um he said of course who would who would want to leave this or you know what who wouldn't want to live here um and so um you know a lot of I think in part because of um, inclusivity, in part because of economic opportunity, there's a sense of a mass exodus away from the region, but there's also a growing youth uh, sense of people um, who have always wanted to stay, but who are, are also now staying and creating, if the opportunities don't exist, they're creating them. Um, and it's really exciting to see. Mm -hmm. um... One of the um, beautiful ways that Micaiah talks about some of the harmful narratives about pa Appalachia is uh, a, in his process of memorializing a friend who passed away from an overdose. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that moment and that question and, and why you feel he really wanted to? Because what struck me in that section of the book is that he says his friend's full name. Mm. Anesco. Yeah, he, you know, this was a difficult moment for him to discuss in part because of, again, a stereotype about um, who's doing what in Appalachia. <laughs> and um, of course, the opioid crisis is um, prevalent in the region. Um, and if you know anything about the history of uh, the pharmaceutical company, you know, there's a, a lot we could talk about with that. But he had direct experience of that uh, with a friend of his. Um, and he, he hesitated telling the story in part because he worried that it would um, just reiterate a stereotype. And yet he also felt like it was uh, imperative that we know his story and know the all the details about how it happened so that if if we're going to ignore Appalachia and what the needs might be in Appalachia, we should have the full picture. Um, and um, so I, I think he was he wanted to memorialize his friend, but also was really careful about um, as he, you know, he used this term, but I, I think this term is familiar to us about trauma porn. I think some of the refugees and immigrants telling the stories about fleeing bombings were also really worried about that kind of um, um, way of hearing uh, dangerous or uh, um, harrowing parts of their story, and yet also simultaneously feeling like um, uh, it was important to know that part of the story and then also know what happened after that moment in the story. Yeah. Is Nikaya one of the narrators who went away to college and came back? Um, he hasn't left the region. At all. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Um, I, I've interviewed many um, folks who have left their country and when I ask them what it is that they miss their most about home, about the place they left, they talk about the 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 their dead, the people that they have not they mm -hmm. will, they will not be able to see again because they're stuck in the U.S. They might not have status or for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, the organization that Makaya uh, talked about in his? narrative and um because i think it speaks loudly about how committed he is to staying 
Yeah. Yeah. So he he's involved with the stay project, which is a kind of an umbrella project um, about, again, creating um, economic opportunities for youth in the region. And the bear project is a part of that black Appalachian youth rising. And he was a, um, a leader in that um, when he was a little bit younger. And some of what they do is a very mutual aid feeling. Um, but also they um, organize conferences and they bring youth together and get them thinking about um, it's a safe place. It's an inclusive place. It get them thinking, get young people thinking about what it means to be Appalachian. Um, and if if they don't identify as Appalachian and yet they're from the region or live in the region, they talk about, well, why don't you identify as Appalachian? Maybe we should take back the Appalachian identity and and. Um, I think this is especially important for the LGBTQ um, a group, um, you know, people who are often made to feel unwelcome within a particular space. Um, the Stay Project and the Bear Project are are working really hard to make um, all people feel included. Um, and so those um, summer conferences that they have um, are um, meant to make people feel um, like they're like they belong here. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of the folks who have resettled from other countries in Appalachia are uh, adopting the Appalachian identity or how how is it complex? <laughs> Well, the, you know, one of the questions I asked all the narrators in the book is whether or not they identified as Appalachian. And um, the, so some people who had only lived here for a few years uh, wouldn't take on that identity yet, um, uh, in part because they just felt like they hadn't lived here long enough, um, um, or they they weren't even quite sure what that meant yet for not having lived here. But what they would do instead is talk about the landscape. And so there were a couple of moments in talking to Amal, who's from Syria, Sohaila, who's from Afghanistan, where they um, talked about seeing the mountains for the first time and that being a real comfort to them because of where they had come from also having mountains. Um, uh, the person who's uh, family ancestors had been here the longest, Rufus, who's uh, part of the Monacan Indian Nation, he really thought hard about whether or not he felt he was Appalachian, in part because of this, the stereotypes that come along with that word, and that often, I think, Appalachians are thought of as white. And he thought that he identified mostly as a Monacan um, and as indigenous. Um, but he wasn't sure about whether or not he identified as Appalachian. And I, th I thought it was really, we had a really interesting conversation about that. And, um, and then um, uh, Elvir, who migrate, who came as a refugee when he was 14 in the early 90s from the Bosnian War, um, he really does feel Appalachian and felt like the place had him had offered him opportunity and embraced him and that the community had embraced him. And he had a really interesting story about where the refugee community lived in the city where he resettled to um, was where the af largest African American community was. And so the high school he went to was considered the African American high school. And he identified with his um, uh, friends. They sort of saw he's white from Bosnia, um, but he was different. And so his Appalachian friends really embraced him in part because of that difference and their sort of shared commonality of, of you know, experiencing uh, racism and difference. And, um, and so he felt like that sort of experience of being embraced like that helped him feel part of Appalachia. And of course, uh, similar um, issues about the landscape. He had come from a rural area and um, really appreciated living in um, in Appalachia because of that. That's amazing. Well, I have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure that I make an announcement for folks that are listening in 
to send us your questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature or you can drop them in the chat. Um, one question I have, I'm gonna go back to Amal's uh, narrative um, because she mentioned that she kept asking, that she had asked for a smaller house. She's like, I don't, I don't care if it's a small house as long as it's clean, but that there was friction with the resettlement office on that because it needed to fit the entire family. So I think my question is about um, agency in these stories mm -hmm. and how Amal was pushing back on this idea of the process of resettlement, how it should be one way. And she was also in a way telling the agency, you need to also consider our cultural um, background and situation um, because many families, including some that I've interviewed who come from Latin America, they live in um, multiple one homes that are for multiple generation generational homes with one or two rooms, but everyone's there, including grandma, uncles, cousins. So, can you talk about that and and if it featured um, in your in the narrative that went into the book or in the interviews? Yeah, th this came up a lot, and you know, I mean, I'm an oral historian, but I'm also a researcher and have some opportunities to present my research to decision makers. And so part of my interest in doing oral history also is in, you know, the United Nations and the US Department of Labor Statistics that there's all the and, and this data for you know they all have these statistics of how many people how many people are this how many people are that um and when you just read those numbers the the experience of people is not in those numbers it's important to understand that and understand immigration in the aggregate like that i, I don't think that we should not have statistics i think we should but understanding those statistics in relation to people's actual experiences. And so, for instance, one of the stories that came up a couple of times with Amal and with um, a couple of the other families who had uh, migrated recently is the, um, especially someone who had, is, whose status is a refugee, there's a 90 day um, period where you, you, you in order to receive assistance, you must find a job within those 90 days. And um, that can cause a real interesting conundrum for families, um, one who maybe don't, uh, who don't speak English or who have um, multiple children or small children who are not school age. Um, and so how do you manage that requirement by the resettlement law while also the reality of your life? Um, or, it, or if you are living in a, an air, whether you're living in an urban area or a rural area, if there's not public transportation and you don't have a driver's license, how will you get to that job? Um, and certainly, um, how will you get, be able to find a job that then matches your own experience or skill set? Um, and this is a, a huge problem uh, generally about the transferability of people's credentials from one place to another. And so that law, the way it's written, really um, exacerbates the problem for families as they're newly settled and causes a, more trauma for them. Um, so one might take a job because they have to, but it's not really the best job for them, um, uh, or it's not safe for them, or they really, uh, um, they really, what they really would like to do is take English classes um, and you know, master English before they take on a job. And so um, or community organizations like uh, refugee partnerships would sort of work in conjunction with the resettlement agencies sometimes will pay um, for the, that assistance to give people a chance to um, uh, take English if they want to. Um, so the, there's just 
being able to hear people's experiences and give them the time to tell those little sort of the minutia of those details of like, I couldn't catch the bus, I had to, or I had to transfer the bus three times to get to the job, and how am I supposed to pick up my kid from school? That, that sort of what seems like monotonous or mundane details is so critical to understand in relationship to the laws that are bearing down on them about what they're, they have to do by a certain date. Um, which is doesn't match the reality of, of one's life often. Yeah. Child care also. Often yeah. when you have a big family, you might leave them with the eldest, you know, but that doesn't fly um, most of the time in the U.S. <laughs> right, right. Um, and then my other question was um, about um, the choice to include both folks that had been generationally in the region and newcomers. Um, and when did you decide on that? Was it early on in the project or in the course of the project? Yeah, it was always part of the project. In fact, it, it took a little while to convince people <laughs> uh to do that because i think a lot of the voice of witness projects are very focused on one on a particular issue you know like the um the high-rise stories in chicago about the dis the raising of the um towers in chicago um that's one particular issue the, this book includes multiple issues but in within a region and uh, so but that seemed to me to be so important because of the, as I mentioned before, the ways that um, harmful rhetoric can actually cause multiple kinds of harm. It can, it does more than just hurt people's feelings. It does more than just um, make someone feel bad because their story is inac is being portrayed inaccurately. And it has material consequences for people. And um, so by putting, um, and also to sort of, I don't know, write the, write the ship in terms of the way the history of Appalachia is told, it's always been a place of movement and migration. Um, the country was founded on displacement people were displaced in order to form the state of Virginia, the state of North Carolina, the Eastern Suwan nation, the Eastern Suwan speaking nations, their quote unquote boundaries are not the same as Virginia and North Carolina. And so that being able to understand that through individual stories about people moving in and out of the place um, for, for generations, I think was was a critical piece because there was a lot of rhetoric floating or still today and you know i'll say that i mentioned in the introduction that um i mean i wrote that introduction before the election but that jd vance's portrayal of appalachia in hillbilly elegy to me is completely false given my experience of talking to people and living living in the area um and so we felt like the stories put together you know whether someone arrived recently 20 years ago or centuries ago their families have been here you know for generations um that that diversity of the experience would counterbalance what something like um hillbilly elegy uh was trying to present which i believe is false i appreciate that katie um thank you so much for this book um I have so many questions, but we're going to take some questions from the audience. And one question um, that I see is, what would be like your advice for starting or to document stories, whether within families or within communities in the region, or even, for example, how do you do document stories in the aftermath of a natural disaster like Mm -hmm. um, Hurricane Helene and mm -hmm. what folks have experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, so Voice of Witness actually has a great um, collection um, edited by Risia Chansky and 
oh, the other editor's name is, is slipping my mind, but um, it's called Me Maria, and it's after um, stories of um, the Hurricane, the Hurricane Maria, Maria in Puerto Rico. And um, I really recommend reading um, not only that book, but also Risi Achansky's article about disaster pedagogy. And she talks a lot about um, the the way storytelling and recounting one's experience in the immediate aftermath of a disaster um, can be really helpful um, for documentation purposes because after um, a few weeks have gone by or a few months go by your memories or your recounting of it can shift and change um, but I, I it, but also the, I, I understand that can be difficult it, it, right if you're in the midst of you know <laughs> trying to um, save your home or, or um, you know, stopping and telling stories might not be uh, what you think of immediately. But as as there are moments to, um, and I think we, we do this as, as a society, you know, to recount uh, what we went through and uh, to share with each other and to hear and to create space for each other um, to um, recount an experience can be really important because as we are able to document what we've experienced or how things came about that then can help hopefully elite, um, make some changes again in policy. You know, I think I really do think that FEMA's um, response to disaster in the last five to 10 years has shifted dramatically because of the disastrous way it responded to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And I think there's been some shift and it may not be perfect, but I do think the stories of people recounting what FEMA didn't do right has impacted what FEMA is trying to do differently uh, now. Um, so it's, I mean, it, there's a sense where storytelling can be healing for an individual perhaps, but also how critical, I mean, this is why we tell, uh, we ask people to share their stories is so that we can understand history um, more broadly. Um, yeah. And so in terms of advice on, on how to do it, you know, there's lots of great, really expensive recording equipment, cameras and audio equipment, you know, that makes it, you know, radio essay ready for NPR. But if you don't have that, you can use uh, most pho um, mobile phones have some sort of software on them to just the voice me memo feature. But there's also lots of apps that are recording apps. Um, and so you can record someone telling their story just on your mobile phone if you have it. Um, the, also, Virginia Tech has a place where uh, the public can come and borrow um, uh, equipment and maybe universities or libraries have equipment sharing um, to do that as well. Um, or just simply write it down and take notes and listen. Um, and I, I think being a good listener is really one of the best things you can do is to give someone an opportunity to tell their story um, and ask follow-up questions um, you know some some people you can ask one question and you don't have to ask another one they just keep going some people might need a little prompting um, and follow-up um, um, but anyone can do it and um, their voice of witness has some great resources on how to get started as well um, i think the curriculum for this book, I think all the curriculum that Voice of Witness does is great, but I love the curriculum for beginning again. Um, uh, Bob Akir, who's one of the narrators, he helped build that curric curriculum and Appalachian Studies uh, scholar um, uh, and teacher at a community college nearby helped develop that curriculum. So these are folks who are, and Bob Akir was, is a teacher himself. And so, you know, these folks, so you can start to think about this in the schools as well. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. This has been such a generative conversation. And um, I appreciate you uh, sharing that anyone can record an oral history or just a conversation on a phone. Just make sure you tell folks, um, can I record you so that they give consent and it can be verbal consent. And definitely the audio feature on most phones, mobile phones, have pretty good quality audio um, and 
there are now there are also um, there are also some software that if the audio isn't good, there's like some free software out there that you can clean up the audio if you really wanted it to be, you know, audio essay ready. Um, so um, Liberty says she has a couple questions. Um, so yes, Liberty, hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I saw the Q&A was a little bit quiet. Definitely want to continue to encourage folks to ask anything there. But yeah, just um, hearing y'all talk, I had a couple questions that I was um, curious about. And, and the first one really builds off of um, something that Fanny was talking about with the the kind of um, many different protagonists, uh, you know, of this book, the different perspectives um, of the narrators. I think I'm curious, um, given uh, that the project in, encompassed both um, indigenous folks, uh, settlers, and new arrivants, um, if uh, you encountered um, uh, encountered things along the way that pointed towards the possibility of solidarities across those identities and experiences. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Yes, absolutely. Um, I one of the things that came up as a theme, uh, again, which was under discussion with voice of witness generally, because I think generally voice of witness is, is hoping to amplify voices of people who have experienced some sort of human rights violation and not necessarily interviewing advocates in those areas or um, volunteers or advocacy groups in those areas. And yet in, in the interviews that I did, volunteerism and giving back to one's community was a constant theme throughout every um, narrator where, you know, um, Amal, for instance, who you heard from, she now is one of the leaders um, at the YMCA giving back to the local community. She's lived here now for a few years. She's fluent in English now. And now when people newly arrive who speak Arabic, she translates for new families. And um, Elvir um, was 14 when he arrived and um, he now um, uh, helps run a youth soccer group and he one one of the, the best lines in his narrative is uh, you know I was one of those young men he he really loves working with the young folks um, as they're sort of figuring out their lives um, as teenagers and what they'll do next after high school and um, and he actually started a scholarship program for the a local community college for people who have been for young students who have been refugees and um, so that sort of um, working across communities um, and building solidarities was very much a theme um, across those narratives because and I think that really speaks to again that sort of um, speaking against that sort of monolithic portrayal of oh, this group over here are victims this group over here are the helpers or the missionaries or the saviors and that's just these narratives throw that out they people don't see themselves as victims they they might see themselves as needing help in a particular moment um maybe uh you know needing assistance getting a medical um uh, uh, um, a medical appointment and then having a translator there with them while they go see the doctor. Um, but they also want to then not be a victim. They want to help and be part and build a community, build their lives, and then be part of um, um, building up that community. And, and in fact, that's, I mean, it, it, that's, you know, part of how we live in a community. And so I, I, I really appreciate your question because I think that's exactly why we wanted to put these narratives together in one place is because people may in moments of their lives um, have experienced something and yet they're constantly, they're like anyone else, you know, they wanna send their kids to school, they wanna have, you know, have a safe place to live and, and have a good job. And, you know, so they're, that's the point we wanted to make in that is that um, they're just like everyone else. Also to add to that, Liberty and Katie, um, Will you share with us the story of Rufus's narrative? Because I think 
that's like an excellent example of collective solidarity because mm -hmm. um, you kept asking him questions about himself, but he kept answering in the collective, in the we. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rufus, um, his job now is to help um, indigenous groups with um, um, housing um, resources and housing equity issues. And um, every time I wanted to get, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, how would people have described him as a child? And he just, it, almost refused to answer it because he wanted to um, talk more about what his community was like and the fact that he lived near several uncles and his great aunts and the stories that they told about the Monacan Indian Nation um, and their history and gar is particularly around gardening and the history of um, um, the seeds and collecting seeds and keeping seeds. Um, and so, um, he and he, he struggled whether or not to include his narrative at all because he felt like it was too focused on him as an individual um and so the the job he has now um is very much a focus on um community and finding access to resources but he also um sees telling stories about the history of the Monacan Indian Nation as a way to also build up the community. Um, and Monacan Indian Nation was only very recently recognized as a federal tribe. And that is a really important piece of that history because you can only um, become sovereign as a group by being recognized as a federal tribe. But the state of Virginia had racial integrity laws in the 1930s that basically erased um, indigenous communities. And so it has met, been a long time um, in terms of, um, you know, denying that group resources. Um, and so I think just back in 2018, they were recognized federally. And that has then for Rufus and, and some of his, um, uh, the other folks who are part of the tribal leadership are really working towards making sure um, folks who are members of that nation then understand what resources are available to them. Well, if I could ask another question, um, uh, I guess thinking thinking about this history and kind of what's happening in the present, um, you know, it's it's clear to me that not only is Appalachia a place that kind of has this kind of long experience of movement and migration, but that movement and migration is very much the future of Appalachia. Um, uh, and I, you know, certainly uh, climate disaster is on my mind living here in Asheville. Um, but I think a lot of us have always known, e even in the narratives of like, oh, some of Appalachia will be a climate haven um, where inevitably people will move to, to escape more at risk areas. Obviously some of that has been challenged a little bit in the last couple months, um, at least for folks in my community, but it is clear that climate change um, will uh, kind of accelerate and increase the amount of movement and migration in and through Appalachia. And I think mm -hmm. my question here is, um, what do you see as needed uh, by our communities um, to prepare for that? Uh, because if we if we know it's coming, I imagine there are uh, there's infrastructural and cultural change that might um, set us up for a, a better outcome. Mm. Gosh, where to begin? Um, well, part of, part of your question made me think also about how important oral history can be in this moment too, right, of climate change and communities um, having to move. I was just thinking in particular about Tangier Island um, and some of the coastal communities and some of the um, dialects in those regions. Um, and by recording the way people talk or to having them tell stories can help document and record some language that might be lost. Um, Louisiana's coastline is, is also experiencing this. Um, and, but in terms of um, the movement and migration within the region more generally, I, I, I think this has this already happened with the pandemic as people were coming out of urban spaces and coming to a region that is perceived to be much more rural. Um, obviously, there are urban areas as well, but um, 
so we've seen some of this already um, with the, um, at least the state of Virginia has put a lot of money toward um, uh, broadband infrastructure to make sure that there's Wi-Fi and internet um, uh, because uh, rural schools and and students having access to um, the internet is being seen as as cr crucial to their educational development. Um, and so, um, you know, I think while some some folks want to sort of come to a rural area to get away from the uh, and to maybe disengage from being connected uh, to the world, having it available, um, especially for educational purposes, I think is and, and for employment per employment opportunities as well. I think there are folks who are able to live in a rural area and still work um, at jobs um, that maybe the offices aren't located uh, here. So, um, yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. Un trying to understand what the what resources are needed, um, what kinds of infrastructure needs to be built, and then most importantly, doing that with the community. Because often, what happened has happened historically in Appalachia is that folks come in and decide what is needed. And Mountain Valley Pipeline is is a and pipelines generally are an example of this of people in the region not wanting something like that and yet folks who aren't from the region making decisions about you know a pipeline kind of coming through the area and making it unsafe for people who live in the region um and while at the same time it did provide some jobs for people so how do we balance you know making sure we provide economic opportunity for people um is a, such a difficult task um but also i think part of my point is that making those decisions with people um, who live in the region as opposed to coming in and, and making kind of whole, whole scale decisions um, for a community. Um, I think that in learning the history of the region and, and in the monuments across the Appalachian project that we're working on right now, the sort of the recurring theme tends to be is these are the stories told or this is the history told about us not by us and so i i would take that same philosophy toward current things being built or current things being decided like being decided with the community as opposed to uh, decided for the community thank you so much katie Liberty, do you have any other questions? Those were amazing questions, by the way. <laughs> I better stop while I'm ahead. <laughs> um, I think uh, the question about um, movement and migration being the future is something that I wish the incoming administration would consider um, because it's definitely the opposite and um, if, if we were to take an example from the current elections, for example, the example of um, Springfield, Ohio, with um, the influx of Haitian immigrants having revitalized the community there and um, new, new businesses are opening up, restaurants. Um, I've always, I remember watching a documentary a really long time ago that is about Chinese food in America and how Chinese food kind of revolutionized culinary, um, the culinary availability in the United States. And so I think when we think about the richness of immigration and um, movement um, and the pollination, if you wanna use a, a nature term, uh, we could really um, grow and thrive, learn from each other, learn new ways of being with each other. Um, so thank you both so much. Um, thank you all who stayed on to listen and to be part of this conversation. We hope that you continue to be in community with us and with Firestorm Books. Uh, you can follow Voice of Witness on social media, sign up for our newsletter so that you can get updates on what we're up to. Uh, you can purchase Beginning Again through Firestorm Books and donate, please donate to their co-op because they've been doing really vital mutual aid work after Hurricane Helene. 
Um, and um, please share um, the book with others, gift it for the holidays. We have um, also another book uh, that we recently released that was part of a fellowship that is currently open. It's called the Storyteller Initiative. Um, and people who apply and if um, what we're offering is 10 up to 10K for one year uh, of a fellowship, if you are working on a project that is interview based, it doesn't necessarily have to be oral history. And if you don't have um, education or background in oral history, we'll provide that, we'll provide mentorship. Um, again, this the fellowship is called Storyteller Initiative. And one of the books that recently came out from that uh, pilot initiative uh, is called Country Queers, A Love Letter, which also features many spaces that are part of beginning again. In, in fact, these two books are probably in conversation with each other in many ways. So thank you all for joining us and stay connected. Um, we appreciate you being here tonight. Liberty, do you want to close those out? Or? Just want to say it's been a huge pleasure to get to hear from you both um, and to hear from the many nar uh, narrators who are contained in this book. It's uh, an important contribution to our entire region and just really appreciate the work that y'all have put into this. Thank you so much for having us. And I will shout out to Jordan Laney, who's here, who was also an interviewer uh, for the book. Um, so glad to see you, Jordan. Amazing. Well, have Thank a great you. evening, folks. Thank we'll hope you. to connect again soon. Take care. Bye.